test, test. Okay. Okay. So, so Martin is the team lead for web application uh, security research at SAP, and I'm a PhD student in this team. And Martin and I are working in the field of security, and we are heavily looking into uh, into topics of web security, and especially, especially into topics like cross-site scripting, clickjacking, cross-domain communication. So everything that that happens in the browser and everything that happens with HTML5. And we do that in two projects, namely WebSend and Struce, whereas WebSend just finished. So currently we are only running Struce. And we are visiting conferences a lot. And on all the conferences, there are different talks about HTML5. And on security conferences, you can often see HTML5 in security talks, or hacking with HTML5, or new vulnerabilities in HTML5 feature X. And there is some kind of preconception that HTML5 is somehow insecure. And a lot of developers also think that. And we think that this perception is, is unfortunate because HTML5 APIs are probably for the first time functionalities or new browser features that come with a very well-defined security model in mind. And to overcome this preconception of this insecurity, we created this talk. And in this talk, we would like to compare HTML5 features with their legacy counterparts. So we look at the features, check which use cases. Oh. With luck. Might work. Ah, great. No, it's off. No, it does no. not. Ah, no. Great. So I got a laser pointer. So the goal of this talk is to compare HTML5 features with their legacy counterparts. So we'd like to, to see how certain use cases were um, done before HTML5 and how they can be done with HTML5 and how the security uh, looks like in these cases. And what we would like to do is we would like to keep score between HTML5 and the legacy features. So let's have a short uh, look on the agenda. So in the beginning, I would like to give a short technical introduction into the topic, so explain the basic security concepts that we have in the browser and how authentication in web browsers work. And then we will have sort of an HTML5 uh, deathmatch against legacy features. And we will have four rounds. So we first speak about client-side cross-domain communication. Then we will talk about in-browser communication. Then about client-side persistency. And in the end, we will talk about click checking. And in the end, we will also have a conclusion. So, but let's start at the beginning with the technical background. So if we talk about HTML5, we first need to define what HTML5 actually means, because the term has some, some different notions depending on who you're talking to. And here I have a good picture that shows the current state or the state of HTML5 one year ago, and it shows basically the complete picture. So what we see here is we see certain different bubbles. And each of these bubbles is one specific technology. And if you look at this picture, we also see three different bigger circles. So we see the inner circle, we see an outer circle that is uh, in blue, and we see the biggest circle in light, light green, I guess. And here we see what HM5 actually is. So in the middle, so this circle here, this one, this shows the initial HTML5 specification that was created by the Web Hypertext Application Technology Working Group. This specification was then handed over to the W3C, which uh, slightly extended this version. And if we are talking about HTML5 um, strictly, we normally need to, to stick to this, this, set, this set of technologies in the middle of here. And then we have the outer circle. And the outer circle contains a lot of different technologies that are not belonging to the HTML5 specifications, but are somehow related to HTML5. And most of the people who speak about HTML5 actually mean the whole picture. So HTML5 is just a buzzword for all the new technologies that are coming into the browser. So everything that is new and that offers an API or uh, enhances the browser's functionalities is called HTML5. And in this talk, we would like to stick to this um, term. So we would like to, to see HTML5 as a buzzword that contains all the new technology and not only the things that are covered in the core specification. 
Before we start with the technical things, we first need to introduce how security in web browsers work. And the most basic thing that we need to explain is the basic web application paradigm and how authentication in such a paradigm works. So in general, in the web, we have uh, two entities, the client and the server. And the server is some host on the internet that has a domain name associated with it. So here, example.org. And the client comes in the form of a browser. And the browser, if, if the user wants to visit a certain website, he specifies the URL and press enter. And then the browser sends an HTTP request. The server processes it, returns an HTTP response, and the browser renders HTML. That's uh, pretty easy. And now authentication comes into play. So if we would like to create sophisticated web application, we need some form of, of login or state tracking in the browser. And this state tracking, this state tracking happens implicitly. So the browser manages all the authentication state for us. So in the beginning, we always have uh, some initialization phase. So for example, we go to a website, we register at a website, and then we log in. And up on the login, we receive some authentication credentials. And these authentication credentials could, could for example, be um, a session cookie, could be a HTTP basic authentication credential, or it could be a client-side SSL certificate. And as soon as we have established a session with the website and authenticated ourselves, the browser manages everything. So the, the browser automatically attaches authentication credentials to all the requests that target a certain website. So if we're, we are registered at example.org and logged into example.org, the browser will always attach cookies to all HTTP requests that leave the browser and target example.org. And this is, very, this is very important, and this has a lot of implications for security. Because we need to think about the, the case where an attacker is able to create an HTTP request in, within our browser. So if he is able to create an HTTP request to example.org, and the browser would attach authentication credentials to the request, and if the attacker would be able to read the response of this request, he could basically leak private data from example.org. And this is exactly the attacker model that we are talking about in this talk. So in this talk, we are talking about the web attacker, and there's not, not somebody that is able to execute code on your machine, but it is somebody that is able to create requests in your browser. So for example, by sending you a link via email, or by luring you onto a website that he controls or where he exploits a vulnerability. So the web attacker is able to display some content and to create um, HTTP requests in your browser. And on a side note, we will also talk about the network attacker. So this is an attacker that sits in the network and is able to intercept or change uh, your network traffic. But this is only a minor thing in this presentation. So what I just said is that web, web browsers handle the authentication implicitly for us. And therefore, we somehow need to prevent that an attacker is able to create an HTTP request to the application and read the response. And this is what the same origin policy is for. And the same origin policy is the most basic security policy that we have implemented in modern browsers. And more specifically, the same origin policy prevents two entities communicating with each other in the browser um, if they are from a different origin. So only two entities that are from, coming from the same origin are allowed to speak to each other in the browser. And the origin is defined by the protocol, the port, and, and the, the host that is used to retrieve an object or an, a communicating party. So for example, a JavaScript from example.org is not allowed to talk to facebook.com and read your private messages at Facebook. And this is what the same origin policy is about. So we, here we see an example. So we have a document. And this document somehow would like to initiate a request. And the request goes to httpexample.com slash b. And in this case, we see that the protocol is the same, the host is the same, and only the, your, the, the, the path component is the same. But the path component is not part of the origin. Therefore, in this case, the browser would grant access and give access to this uh, document. Another example is here. Here we see a website from httpexample.org would like to access a website on www.example.com. I said org. And in this case, we have a host mismatch. 
So here we have the host example.com and here we have the, uh, the host www.example.com. And therefore, the browser prevents uh, these two sites from communicating each other. And this also hosts for different protocols and different ports. And this is the main security policy that we have, and this prevents an attacker from sending HTTP requests to another website and read this response. So from preventing evil.com to access your private Facebook messages at facebook.com. And now I would like to have a look at the case where we do not have a same pol origin policy. So I, I, only, I assume same origin policy would not exist. What could the attacker do? So, so what is the same origin policy for? And in this case, we assume we have a very simple example. So we have two server, kittenpix.org, and we have a server webmail.com. And on the client side, we have a browser, and in the front of the browser, we have a user. And the user is logged into webmail.com and receives an email. And in this email, the attacker writes, well, I have a nice uh, website for you with the lots of kitten pics. So you should click on this link. And the user would click on this link and load HTML from kittenpics.org. And what he would see is very nice kitten pics. So he's very happy. But what he cannot see is a JavaScript coming also from kittenpics.org. And this JavaScript could do malicious things. So we assume the same origin policy does not exist. So this JavaScript could simply initiate a request to webmail.com. The browser would attach authentication credentials in the form of cookies, and then the response would be returned to the JavaScript, and the JavaScript could read your email and send it back to the attacker. So this is the case when we do not have the same origin policy. So what the attacker is able to do in this case, if he would not have this policy, is he could leak sensitive information. For, from, he could read your email from webmail.com. But he could also conduct state-changing actions. So for example, he could instruct webmail.com to send an email in your name. And if we take these two capabilities together, we merely end up with session hijacking capabilities. So the, an attacker could impersonate you and could do things in your name and read all the stuff. And therefore, it's very good that we have the same origin policy. And the same origin policy protects us from, from this um, security threat. So now let's have a look at HTML5 and the new HTML5 APIs. And if you look at them and uh, dig a little bit into the specifications, we see that a lot of HTML5 APIs are currently weakening the same origin policy. So they create ways to work around the same origin policy. So at first, I think a lot of uh, you would, would ask, so is HTML5 a bad thing? So same origin policy protects us from session hijacking capabilities for attackers, and there are HTML5 APIs that weaken this protection against this session hijacking. And well, the short answer is no, it is not bad. And the long answer is no, it is not bad because the, w the ways that developers used before are, are way worse. So we should, should stick to new APIs with, client, uh, with security models uh, created specifically to, to counter such attacks. And now we will see how that looks like. So now we will have a look into different and compare different HTML5 and legacy features. And first I would like to look into client-side cross-domain communication. And here the problem is the following. So we have a developer and developer says, well, I would like to, to open up my site, would like to create an API for my site, so I would like to offer a cross-domain data sharing or data providing service. So I would like to provide data to somebody else to another domain, and this data is somehow dependent on the authentication state. So it is important that there's some, some kind of user authentication involved in it. And if we look at the same origin policy, the same origin policy forbids this case, because in the problem statement we see that it's a cross-domain data providing service. So same origin policy would say no, this is not allowed because cross-domain, the host is different, I, I block such a request in the browser. And well, developers are intelligent and they found ways to work around these restrictions in the browser. And there are basically two ways to do so, and this is JSONP and flash-based cross-domain requests. And we will now look into these two cases and uh, look into the security. So let's first see what JSONP is. So as I told you, the same origin policy um, manages all the, all the communication in the browser. 
But there's one thing where the same origin policy does not hold, and this is HTML, HTML tags. So you, for example, you can use an iframe to frame a cross-domain resource. They are the same origin policy that not, does not intercept this request. And you can also include cross-domain scripts. So you can open a script tag in your website and embed a cross-domain script. And JSONP uses this functionality to circumvent the same origin policy. And JSONP is basically an endpoint that creates a JavaScript for you that calls a certain method. And I have a picture here. It works in the following way. So we have a website, and this website cr first creates some functionality, a, a function. And then we see a real-world example of a script. And this script is, the, is uh, the Flickr API. So here you say, OK, I would like to have a new script. And within this script, I provide a URL. And this URL, I, I hand over the, the name of this function, of this process JSON function. And then Flickr dynamically generates a script for me that calls this function. So this script tag lets, uh, loads this script at this URL and then simply executes it. And in the script, we will see a call to this function process JSON. And the parameter of this function will be given to this, this function. And in this way, I can get data from Flickr within my, my website and process it. And if we look at the security of this, there are two major security concerns that we see here. So the first thing is that you should only use JSONP for public data, because you cannot control who is the one that, imp or that, 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 that uses your script. So you offer such an API, you create such a service that creates a script with the JSONP, in it, but you cannot control um, which party will, will include this script in, in its website. So it could be used by example.org, but it called, could also be included by evil.com. So you do not have any access control. All the data that you share in a JSONP is basically public. And the second point, this is um, also very, very uh, security critical, is you basically execute a foreign script in your website. So in this case, we, we executed a script coming from Flickr.org within our domain. That means that we basically grant, grant the, the, the other party to execute code in our context. And this is a very, very bad thing. But let's first look, um, before we, we, we compare this to HTML5, we will have a look at the, at the second technique. And the second technique was introduced uh, in Flash. And Flash int introduced the possibilities to conduct cross-domain requests by opting out of the same origin policy. So a website is able to say, well, I don't want to be protected by the same origin policy. Please share, share some data. And how this works, we will see now. So in the Flash case, we have um, two servers. One is called b.net, and the other one is c.net. And we again have a browser and a user in front of the browser. And the user visits b.com, and b.com somehow would like to consume data that is provided by c.net. And that is uh, protected by the same origin policy. So basically, in the, via JavaScript, this is not possible. But what b.net is able to do, so the first thing that, that c.net has to do is to set up a policy for, for the Flash file. So c.net sets this policy and says, I would like to opt out of the same origin policy for b.net. So I would like allow b.net to access data on my domain. And then b.net is able to include a Flash applet into its size that is hosted by b.net and is executed in the context of b.net. And this Flash applet is able to do cross-domain requests in a secure fashion. And it does so, so if the website would like to initiate a request to b.net, the Flash plugin actually downloads the policy of c.net and checks whether b.net is contained in this policy. So it creates a request and gets the policy, checks if the policy is valid, and if b.net is, is allowed to conduct requests to a c.net. And if it is allowed, it will conduct the request and attach the cookies to it. So then it can, can get user-authenticated user, uh, data from c.net. And here's how such a policy looks like. So this is a very simple cross-domain policy, and it contains two entries, basically. So it says, well, allow access from google.com and allow access from facebook.com. So in this case, the site will say, I don't want to use same origin policy for those two sites. They are allowed to send cross-domain requests to me and receive the corresponding responses. 
And this is a quite secure policy. The problem is here that you can do this. What you can do is you can put a wildcard into this field and say, well, I would like to grant access to all other websites on the web. And this is not really a security problem per se, because um, if you only host public data, this is, this is okay. You can do this. But this is not okay, and this is a security problem if you host private data, for example, the user's name or credit card information on your website. So we, we were interested in this, and we conducted a study. So we were interested in how, how common is it that people put wildcards in their cross-domain policy files. And we um, crawled the top 1 million Alexa domains, and basically we found about 80,000 cross-domain policies, and about 40% of those 80,000 policies, namely uh, 31,000 um, policies, contained a general wildcard. And this uh, related, it was related to 2.8% of all the analyzed sites. So 2.8% of all the sites on the web say we would like to opt out of the same origin policy. And this is still not a, a security problem per se, because if they are only hosting uh, public data, and therefore we, we dig in a little bit deeper, and we have some uh, statistics here. So here we see a graph, on, and on the y-axis we see, um, see the percentage of sites that actually have a, have a policy or have a wildcard, and on the x-axis we see the, the Alexa rank. And what we see here in the blue curve is the number of sites that offer cross-domain policies. And what we see is that there's a huge peak at the beginning. So the pop more popular sites are using that heavily. And then we have a, a red curve here. And the red curve shows the number of policies that contain a wild card. And what we see is that the curves are, yeah, they are rather running in parallel. So we cannot say that there's some kind so, so untrustworthy sites or not so popular sites are using that more insecurely, but all of the sites are using that in the same fashion. And what we then did, we, um, we inspected the sites and tried to look for hints that there is not only public data on these domains. So what we did, we were, we were looking for, for login forms on the, on the start pages, and we also checked whether there are some session cookies in place. And we correlated this data with the, with the other data, and these are the sites that have a wildcard policy and at the same time have some kind of login or some kind of, um, some kind of session, session cookie or session data in it. And these are still a lot of sites. So 2.8% or 2.5% approximately uh, have this. So this is a real problem. And now let's have a look at the HTML5 way of doing cross-domain requests. And the HTML5 way of doing this is cross-origin resource sharing. This is a rather new concept, and this extends the old browser's XML HTTP request object to allow cross-domain requests. And the system is very similar to the one provided by Flash. So the site that receives the request has to whitelist the site that conducts the request to access the data. But the implementation is a little bit different, so Flash uses this policy file and course uses HTTP headers to conduct this. And now let's shortly compare the security. So course is basically the same as the Flash model. So it provides the same security guarantees, but with two, two differences. So it also, course also allows wildcards in its policies, but the difference is as soon as you specify a wildcard in your domain, the browser will not send any cookies to this site. So you are not able to provide a wildcard and at the same time shoot in your fo foot um, and, and, pro and share all your, all your pub private data to the public. So if you, do, if you provide a wildcard, it's totally secure. And if you only, only whitelist a few sites, it's also, also secure. This is the one major difference. And the second major difference is that you have a much finer control about, uh, about the access control. So in Flash, you can only whitelist another domain to access all your data on your website. And perhaps you have a file that's called api.php that you would like to share, and you have a private profile.php that you don't like to share. You cannot easily do it. You can do it with Flash, but it's, it's uh, much more difficult. And in course, you have a much finer control about your access, access controls. 
And here's also a so short slide about the, the usage of course, so how, how widespread is course, and this is already implemented. And this is a very old picture, I guess it's more than a year old, and we see in the browsers, in the current browsers, a year ago, course was implemented in all versions, except Opera Mini. And I guess the, the market share of Opera Mini is not that, that big. Okay, so let's have a look at the score, and who thinks that the HTML5 feature is more secure than the legacy one? Only three, four people? So I think so too. So I guess the first point goes to HTML5. Now let's have a look at the second round, at in-browser communication. And let's uh, again look at the problem statement. So we have a developer, and a developer says, well, I have a website, and this website frames some other websites. And I would like to communicate with this frame. So I, somehow I have this website, and I would somehow exchange data. And then the same origin policy says, no, this is not allowed, because this is a cross-domain resource in this frame, and I don't allow access to this frame. So you are not allowed to, to exchange data. And developers are intelligent, so they say, well, I do it anyways. And there are two different techniques that, that uh, can, 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 can be used uh, to create such a use case. And this is hash identifier parsing and the window name property. So let's first talk about hash identifier parsing. This is a very obscure technique to, to transfer data between two frames that are on cross domain, uh, on, on different domains. And it works as follows. So we have a site, and this site has a frame to another domain, and it would like to communicate. And it is not able to access the content or the URL of the frame, but what it is able to do, it is able to redirect this frame to another, to another URL. And the same holds for the frame, so the frame is able to redirect the, f the page it is framed in. And here the, the, the hash identifiers come into play, and the hash identifiers are the, the things that you can see in URLs after the, the, hash, uh, the hash sign. And if you reload a URL where only the hash sign or the, only the fragment of the URL changes, there is no redirect, uh, no reload happening in the browser, but just the fragment is changed. So what the two sides can do is they can redirect each other to the same URL, but only with a changed hash identifier. And therefore, and then listen to the hash identifier. So they, they just do an interval, and then every, every second they query the hash and see whether the hash has changed. And in this way, they can transfer, transfer information with each other. So as soon as the, the top frame wants to send information to, to the frame, it redirects the frame to, to, the, to another hash identifier, the frame extracts the hash, then it reloads the, the top frame with another identifier, the top frame extracts the information contained in the hash. So this is the first technique. And this, the second technique is the window name attribute. And the window name attribute is, is a DOM property that is somewhat strange, because it's the only property in a DOM that is not protected by the same origin policy. So the window name attribute can be set across the main boundaries, and it can be read across the main boundaries. The only thing that you need is you need a window handle in your JavaScript of that window where you would like to extract, extract the name. And if you open a site as a pop-up, or if you frame a site, you will, you will be able to get such a window handle. So what you can do is you can set the name of the other, other window. The other window can extract, extract the, the value, then write another value into the name, and you can extract the thing um, of, of the window name attribute. And this is, for instance, used in the Dojo framework to enable cross-domain communication in older browsers. And in these two technologies, we have two major security problems. And these are authenticity and confidentiality. So authenticity in the sense that we are not able to control who put the information there. So if, 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 if a site is called and a hash identifier is passed, we are not able to tell who, who sent this. Is this evil.com who sent this specific hash identifier, or was it the legitimate site at example.org? And the same holds for window.name. We can simply extract the name or the, the value of the name um, attribute, but we are not able to tell who put it into the name attribute. And the second problem is confidentiality. So window name is cross, uh, readable across domain boundaries, and 
the, the, the value stays even after a navigation. So for example, if you have a site and put some confidential information into your name attribute, and then the attacker is able to redirect the same window to his side, he's able to extract the values from the name attribute. So this is very bad because uh, information can be lost and be accessed by third parties. Now let's have a look at the HTML5 way of doing things. And the HTML5 way of cross-frame communication is the post message API. And this is a, a rather new API that allows the sending of messages from, from one frame or pop-up to the other. And this works in this case. So as soon as you have a window handle, here we can see this is the window handle, and you can simply call the post message function, then pass a message and tell the function a target origin. And this is important for security. We'll talk about this later. And then you will send this message to this window. And this window then has to listen for messages. So messages are not received automatically, but the page needs to, to add an event handler for the message event. And as soon as a message arrives, the, this, this handler function is called. And then here, here we see the handler, the handler function. And the handler function gets an event object passed to it. And this event object contains information about the origin of the message. So we can see this here. We can make a security check and say, if event.origin equals our trusted site, then we process this message, otherwise we drop it. And here we can see that the post message um, gives you three guarantee. So the first is confidentiality. And this is achieved by adding this target origin here. If you provide a target origin, for example, you, you would like to send a message to example.org, then you provide example.org in this case, but if the attacker, for example, managed to redirect this frame to evil.com, the browser will notice that the, the, the frame that is actually loaded, evil.com, is different from the target origin you provided. And therefore, the, the browser will not send the message to this frame. So therefore, we, we can guarantee that the message only arrives at a site that is intended to receive the message. The second property is authenticity. And authenticity is achieved by by this event.origin uh, attribute. So whenever we receive a message, we can check where it is coming from. And if this is a trusted site, we can process the message. And if it's not a trusted site, we won't process this message. And the third one is integrity. And integrity ensures that as long as we do not have cross-site scripting attackers, but then we have other problems on our domain, um, the message cannot be intercepted or altered by third parties. So now let's have a look at the score again. And I think this round clearly goes to the HTML5 post message API. So it's 2.0 for HTML5. So now let's talk about local persistent state. And let's have a look again at the, at the problem statement. A developer says, well, I would like to create an application that permanently stores data on the client's computer. And then, well, this is somewhat constructed. The same origin policy says, no, 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 this is not allowed. Files are only accessible via file URLs. And we are in HTTP, so we are not allowed to, to do this. And well, developers are intelligent. So developers say, well, we do it anyways. And a technique that can be used for storing data on the client's machines are cookie hacks. And this is. Uh, quite easy, so cookies um, are stored on the client's machine and are sent to the server at each request. But if we want to, sh to, to store a data, data on the machine, we can simply set a cookie and put our data in there. And well, this, this, this works quite well, but um, a problem is that cookies are very small, so you cannot put a lot of data in there. And the second thing, that is, is not very good with cookie hacks is that you have a lot of network overhead. So if you, if you put a cookie into a, a, um, a URL that is a, available, you send out your data um, over the network all the time. So let's talk about the security of cookies. And if we store data in cookies, we have to know that cookies adhere to a significantly more lax same origin policy. So they do not adhere to 
port, protocol, and host, but mostly only to the host. And even the host, this, even this is not really true. For example, if you have, a, if you have a cross site scripting on a subdomain, you can access the cookies of a father domain. So cookies are not really protected by the same origin policy. And the, the second problem is that a network attacker could force the, your application to send out such a, a cookie containing confidential information. So let's assume you, you set a cookie, then a, a network attacker could, could inject a frame into your HTTP communication, could make your browser create an, an, an HTTP request to a certain URL for which the cookie was set, and then the cookie is sent over network, over the network, and the network attacker could extract the cookie. So let's again have a look at the HTML5 way of keeping local persistent state, and this is the web storage API. And this is a new API that is uh, provided uh, to JavaScript, and this API al allows you to store key value pairs within the browser of the user. So you can simply use the, here the local storage, which is one, one, uh, one sub-storage, there's also the session storage, and you can use local storage to simply say, store the value bar under the key foo. Then you can close the website, you can close the browser. Uh, weeks later, you can open the browser again, go to the same website, and then the, the same website can do local storage, get item, and then provide this key foo here, and it will receive the value bar in its test variable. So this is a way how data can be stored in local storage and the local storage strictly adheres to the same origin policy. So each website gets an own storage area assigned to it, each origin even. So, so one website is not able to access data of another website. And therefore, let's have a look at the score again. And I guess this round also clearly goes to the HTML5 web storage API. Okay, so now we covered a few functionalities that are used by applications to, to provide certain use or to create certain use cases or to provide, implement certain use cases. And now I would like to also talk about specific security features. So normally I would like to talk about two things, about click jacking and about cross-site scripting, but I left out cross-site scripting because of uh, timing reasons. So we will only talk about click jacking protection. And we'll first have a look at what click jacking is and how legacy protections against click jacking work. So click jacking or UI redressing is an attack where an attacker tries to steal clicks of a user. And how this works is the following. So an attacker has its website evil.com and what he does is he frames a site he wants to attack within an iframe. Then he somehow hides the iframe. For example, by making it invisible, by making it very small, only one pixel large, or by covering with other elements. And then he somehow tricks the user into clicking on his website. And shortly before clicks arrive, the, the, the attacker moves the iframe under the mouse of the user. And then the, the user clicks, and instead of clicking on the attacker's page, the click goes to the hidden iframe. And therefore it clicks some elements on the hidden iframe. And if you have your administration panel of your website and there is a delete the whole application button and you hit it, you might be deleting your application without wanting it. And a legacy protection that is used to counter such threats are JavaScript frame busters. So the idea is that we would like to prevent this first step, this framing cross-domain content. And we can see a very naive and uh, broken implementation here. So here we simply have a, a, a small JavaScript, and in this JavaScript we check if the parent frame is different from the own frame. And if we are not framed, this is the same, so the, the check will, uh, will not be executed, but if we are framed, the parent is different from our own frame, and therefore a redirect is conducted from parent location to self location. So basically, we redirect the top frame or the, 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 the side that, that frames us to our own location and effectively busting out of the frame and loading our page as the main page. And this JavaScript implementation is seriously flawed because there are a lot of uh, different ways to circumvent it. So basically there are two ways. The first way is to prevent, uh, prevent the JavaScript from executing. So one, one attack that uh, was used was misusing cross-site scripting filters. 
So cross-site scripting filters some, sometimes deactivate certain JavaScripts if they think they are injected by an evil attacker. So what an attacker does is he puts the frame bus into the URL that this makes the cross-site scripting filter think this frame bus is injected and says, well, I deactivate this. This might be an, an attack. And then the frame buster does not run and you can frame the site and do your click checking thing. <coughs> the second technique to prevent JavaScript execution was using HTML5 sandboxed iframes. So in sandboxed iframes, a way to, to somehow sandbox content, for example, provided by user, and you can use, it, use a frame and say, well, this is sandbox, don't execute JavaScript in this frame. And then the frame bus is not executed, and again, you can conduct your, cross, uh, your, your click checking attack. And the second possibility that you can do is you can prevent the redirect. So in this case, in this frame buster here, we see there is a redirect happening. And there are three different techniques how we can stop redirects in a browser. The one is uh, quite, quite interesting, the 204 flushing. It was simply um, an attacker can, can basically flush the, the, the buffer that the browser has to store all the, all the redirects that he, he can do by, um, by sending a lot of 204s. So 204 is a, an HTTP uh, response uh, code that says bas basically says do nothing. So the, the attacker conducted a lot of 204s. The browser does a lot of uh, requests, but always does nothing. And then for, somehow forgot that he needs to redirect this page where the frame buster is, is on. And then there are other techniques like double framing, or you can simply ask the user nicely. So you can simply ask, would you really like to, to leave this website? And if the user presses no, the redirect is canceled. So this JavaScript implementation is, is really flawed that we saw here. And there are ways to create secure frame busters, but the knowledge about this is, very, is not very widespread. And most of the frame busters uh, look, like, look like this one and not like the secure ones. So let's look at the HTML5 way of doing this. And here we use the buzzword HTML5. So XFrame options is not really an HTML5 feature, but we say HTML5 is everything that is new within the browsers. And XFrame options is an approach that was introduced by Microsoft. And this is an HTTP response header that you can specify for a page. And in this HTTP response header, you can specify whether a page is allowed to be framed or not. And if a browser receives such a page that has such a header attached to it, it will enforce the behavior that you specified. So if you say framing is forbidden, the browser won't frame this page at all, but show, simply show a white empty page. And the, the big advantage is that this is not a JavaScript solution, so you do not have to rely on certain properties of the language, or you do not have to rely that, that JavaScript is, is actually activated, and uh, therefore it's much harder to to segment. So therefore, let's look at the score again. I think here also the Xframe auto options header wins, and therefore it's 4-0 for HTML5. So now let me shortly draw a conclusion. So what we saw in this talk is that modern browser features are not there for fun. They are there for a reason. So somebody thought about it, and there were needs by developers that pre, pre them, and these modern browser APIs were introduced to realize certain cases, which were already realized before, but with a much better security model in mind. So the, the JavaScript solution and the hacks that we just saw, they do not have a security model at all. At least Flash has one, but it's also not very good. And these APIs are for the first time really designed with security in mind. And therefore, they are not as bad as their preconception might be. And often they are even superior on a functional level. So they can do more and they can store more data or, or give finer access control than the legacy features. With this, I would like to thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, you are free to ask. Yes? Yes, you, you can protect the cookie with the, the HTTP only flags, but only against a web attacker. For example, you cannot protect the cookie against a network attacker that is in your network. He will still be able to read, read it. And um, yeah, cross-site scripting for local storage is a problem, and you, you should somehow protect against it. 
and um, yeah, but there, there is no real good solution. But local storage is much, much better suited for storing data than for cookies. Cookies are not made for, for storing data and are not made for storing sensitive data. Um, but lo local storage is made for, sensitive, uh, for, for data at least, and if you store sensitive data, you should have some kind of policy. And you can also extend local storage to have certain security properties. So if you like to, to have encryption, so we thought the, the JavaScript uh, encryption talk a few hours ago, you could use this um, much better than with cookies. Other questions? Yes. Okay. By using HTTP only uh, flag, you by definition, by, by its usage, you can no longer use cookies to store browser because you cannot create. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Of course, of course. Yeah, of course. That. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Can you just repeat that? Um, yeah. The, 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 the comment was that um, you you um, if you use the HTTP only flag. And that's, that's correct, that you cannot access the data anymore on the client side. So if you want to process it on the client side, you have a problem. Other questions? Okay, then uh, thank you very much.